This is Agriculture Today. I'm Samantha Bennett with the K-State Radio Network. Today on this Monday's program, we have K-State livestock economist Glenn Tonzer. He brings us up to date for this week's cattle market segment. He provides information on the economic impact of the extreme temperatures we've been experiencing and why consumer demand is decreasing. Additionally, we have Jeff Whitworth, K-State field crop entomologist. He discusses what producers need to know about managing potato leaf hoppers and their alfalfa and his expert opinion on insecticide seed treatments in relation to soybeans. Last but not least, we have with us Drew Ricketts for our wildlife segment for this week. He's our K-State wildlife extension specialist, and he's going to talk about bats and what listeners should know if they find them in their homes. That and more waits for you on this Monday edition of Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. We're back now on our cattle market segment. We're going to be covering the latest with Glenn Tonzer, a professor in our Ag Econ department here at K-State. So let's start off first and foremost with those cash markets. What do we see this week? This past week, AMS called the Fed cattle market narrowly the five area market about 145 through Thursday. That's Fed cattle harvest weight. The board to round this out because I'm going to give you cash and the board together. So CME June live cattle was 138 early on Friday morning. That's up about three bucks for the week. Flip it over to feeder cattle. So AMS called the Pratt market on Thursday five to ten bucks higher, depending on what weight class you'd look at. I really like to give two specific lot examples here, Samantha. Mm-hmm. As 263 head weighing 769 pounds, AMS quoted at 183, and then a larger lot, 340 head weighing 933 pounds, went for 174. Those would both be up on the week compared to similar lots. The August feeder cattle contract from CME as 172 was up about a dollar for the week. So on balance, uh, the market was flat or up, depending on which ones you want to talk about. I don't think that's a consumer demand thing. We're going to talk about consumer demand here in a moment. In terms of futures, when we're not thinking short term, what, what does the futures market look like? The June live cattle contract there is 138, and that's fed cattle. It was up three bucks for the week, and August feeder cattle was 172, up one dollar from the week before. What, what do we see here? Certain cuts going on. Yeah, so the box beef cutout, which is the wholesale beef measure, uh, choice cutout was 267 through Thursday. It was down about four bucks from the Thursday before, and then select beef was 245 down about five bucks from the week before. That's the prelude to my demand comment. We're going to share a lot of demand information in a moment, but there's some signs that beef demand is waning. I think that's showing up in the box beef cutout values as well. And then in terms of processing status, where does it look like we're at? Yeah, so another busy week. So the initial estimates that the USDA puts out is a 667,000 head, which would be the volume through Saturday. It's an estimate. That compares to a year ago with 664,000, and last week was 674,000. Those are all three, both you know this week, last week, and a year ago, large volumes. It's a reminder that the industry is fairly full with market-ready cattle. We're going to get past that at some point, but for a couple months we've been talking about a lot of market-ready cattle in the feedlot sector. We've experienced some challenges with our weather conditions here in the past week. Let's let's kind of touch on that in terms of where the market has stood. Sure. And as an important upfront point, you know, you're new to this segment, but I'm pretty sure you're not a weatherman. Uh, I'm an economist. I'm not a weatherman. So, you know, we can't predict what's going forward. But, you know, I've had people describe to me it is, you know, abnormal weather, particularly too warm at night. So the cattle haven't been able to cool off. And there's been a lot of media attention to the topic. Our listeners are well aware of that. You know, we're doing our best to report what we think and what we hear from defendable sources. And 2,000 head have been lost is the best number I have. So that's what I'm going to run with here, specific to Kansas, that is. So for context, 2,000 head would be less than 1% of the inventories here in Kansas. So Kansas is a major feedlot state. Two and a half million head are on feed in Kansas per USDA estimates, most recent cattle on feed report. So context is important. That loss of 2,000 head, I don't want to ignore, Mm -hmm. particularly for the operations that incurred that. That's a very big deal. Mm -hmm. But I think about that as a localized individual event that's very disastrous for those operations. I don't want to mislead anybody. But that isn't going to move the needle, so to speak, because, again, just do simple percentages on the herd. What is also important to recognize here, I think the economic impact isn't the loss of the 2,000 head 
it, but it's probably the stories we're going to hear in the future about the reduction on production. So animals that went off feed or slowed their weight gain or maybe even lost some weight but did not perish, you know, there's probably more animals that were impacted by that, and that definitely is a production loss that leads to an economic loss for the owners of those animals eventually. That's significant when we're talking about feedlots because that's the finishing stage. That's really what those operators exist for. It is, and for some context, I've been giving other people doing a lot of interviews on this topic the last couple of days. If you want a rule of thumb, each animal that would be leaving the feed yard right now is worth roughly $2,000 per head. And I say roughly because it depends on the weight and the production specs. And so is each of those animals that are market ready but you aren't able to sell, that's basically $2,000 that is not coming in of revenue you would have had wow. after having a massive amount of investment buying the animal, feeding it, all the labor and so forth. So I want to recognize the event and not ignore it for the local operations. But the real deal is, in aggregate, is the production hit. How much will we either slow down cattle and or have lower weights because of it, or just more expensive feed conversion bills to get them back where they were? All of those are expensive economic events. What are the returns looking like as of June 9th? So, Samantha, every month I put up on our Ag Manager website, which I hope you get used to going there and quoting. Uh, there's it's a lot of good information resource. there. Uh, neither you or I are biased, of course, but it's a good <laughs> resource here. Uh, but each month I take information from the Focus on Feedlot Survey, and that gives me what we would call just base production information, which is related to the topic we just talked about. So placement weights, out weights, con- feed conversion, that kind of stuff is what I get from that resource. And then I marry it up with market information. So Kansas corn, Kansas feeder cattle, Kansas fed cattle prices, and then forward-looking I use the CME futures market to come up with projections for margins. So the table that we're going to talk about here, some of your listeners pull that up monthly and they're used to seeing it. But the punchline here would be net returns have been positive, but they are narrowing in the months ahead. And they're narrowing for two main reasons. One is the cost of gain. What it costs to put the pounds on is going up. And I'm going to give some historical context on that in a moment. And the price that feedlots have been paying for feeder cattle been going up. And they continue to go up going forward in these closeout months. So unless we have a notable rally in sales price to offset that, you're having margin compression. Mm -hmm. And we have negative projected closeouts. So animals leaving the yard here in June through September are projected to be at a loss. And by the time we get to October, that turns positive. So we probably have a few months ahead of us here where those feedlots that weren't hedged, and this is a cash-to-cash kind of situation, facing some small losses. Hopefully by the time we get to the holidays at the end of the year, that turns into positive. So for additional context on the cost of gain, again, I've been doing this series, I believe, since 2012. Um, And yes, I am that old man that's been doing it for a while. (laughs) Uh, And you can look back over time at how the cost of putting weight on in a feed yard has varied over time. And the most recent month that I have closed the book on is April of 2022. And the cost of gain on the closeouts in April this year were $120. For context, in 2021, that was $96. So anybody that's good at math knows that's a big percentage jump. And if I keep going back in time, in 2020, it was $87. In 2019, it was $88. And in 2018, it was $79. So we've had a notable increase and the cost to put weight on. This is not unique to the feedlot industry, by the way. The production cost and about everything in our society is higher. Mm -hmm. But if you want to know why discussion about higher cattle prices, higher livestock prices, more generally higher meat prices is at play, the cost of producing those items, and in this case, the cost of putting pounds on in a feed yard, is up notably compared to just a year ago and certainly compared to three and four years ago. Over the course of four years, an increase that significant, it's going to have impacts. Yep. And the two biggest drivers here would be feed cost. So anybody that's following corn prices compared to before sees that and labor cost. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's still a challenge to secure and keep labor. And if you do, you're probably paying a much higher wage than you were in the past. Yeah. And we'll actually have a segment coincidentally later this week on that labor crisis that we're kind of experiencing right now. We mentioned we're going to talk about demand here. So let's get into that. Yeah. And this is the first the series you and I've done. Um, As long as I'm on, you're going to have to hear me talk about meat demand. (laughs) I'm on a, a career mission to to educate folks on what it is. It's not just consumption and how important it is to producers. Mm-hmm. So bear with me in the you know days, <laughs> weeks, months, years ahead on that, Samantha. Uh, Eric did a good job of tolerating that. But the two things I want to pull information from are one is a beef and pork checkoff supported project called the Meat Demand Monitor that's based here at K-State and then some USD information. So they're two different sources. They both have some similar trends to them here. But the MDM project gives us insights on the month 
month of May. Retail, so think grocery store, as well as food service, so think restaurants. Meat demand in both market channels domestically was down in May compared to April. I think that is, I used this phrase earlier, is consumers tightening their belts. Mm -hmm. Uh, Net pay is declined for the majority of folks uh, when you account for inflation. And consumer sentiment, the University of Michigan's ongoing consumer sentiment index that's been going on, I believe, since the 70s, if I understood the media attention a few days ago, hit an all-time low. The average U.S. resident is quite pessimistic about the general financial and economic situation. It's not surprising when that's the case and they're having net pay decline, they're tightening their belt. As an example of the changes they're making, one of the things we track in that meat demand monitor now is we just ask a direct question uh, in response to higher retail meat prices, what are you doing? Two-thirds say they're making some type of a change. And the most common change, and we found this, I believe, for four months in a row, is they're buying the same preferred item. So the same branded or unbranded, the same cut, they're just buying fewer of them. And it aligns with my comment about meat demand slipping some in the month of May. Early signs for June is it may have slipped more as well. But again, that's me kind of guessing two weeks before we've ended the data collection. When we're looking at some older USDA base you know, insights, what are we seeing in comparison? Yeah, so I mentioned this MDM is a survey-based effort, which many of our listeners are aware of because I talk about it regularly. But I get information that's an, another month older from USDA. Try not to confuse people, but there are different ways to look at demand, and they, they vary in exactly the depth and precision that they give us is why I bring both to you here, Samantha. Mm-hmm. But for the month of April, that's the most recent we can look at with USDA data, is domestic meat demand was down for March, about 10%, whether we look at beef, pork, or poultry demand. Important Importantly, in April, beef and pork demand were still up from April of 2021. So April or May probably was the switch point for pretty much the whole quote-unquote pandemic and now I hope post-pandemic period, if that term exists here, mm-hmm. is we've, we may have hit a high water mark on domestic meat demand. And I think it's a natural response to, again, the net pay decline. Uh, who knows what the months ahead you know hold if inflation gets tamed down some. Maybe that story changes. But the domestic demand per USDA started to decline in April, and it started to decline in May per the meat demand monitor. I always describe demand as a three-legged stool. We have domestic grocery store, we have domestic food service, and then we have export. Those are the three market channels for all our meat products. And April, export, so demand from foreign buyers for U.S. meat, beef, pork, and broiler demand was all down compared to March, so month over month was declines. Beef remains up from April of 2021 for several months now, Beef demand has been higher by foreign buyers for U.S. beef than it was the year before. Export demand is always important, but it's extra important if we have some strength there or less weakness maybe than we have domestically because it can mitigate some of the downward pressure that comes from domestic meat demand slipping. That was Glenn Tonzer, a professor in our Ag Econ department here at K-State. Today we have with us Jeff Whitworth. He's a field crop entomologist and extension specialist here at K-State. We're going to be talking about a pest producers should be keeping in mind this time of year and also some treatments that they might want to be considering. Jeff, thank you so much for being with us today. Yes, my pleasure. And welcome to Kansas State University and the Kansas State Extension and Research Network. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So we're going to start off talking about alfalfa, specifically a pest that is affecting that crop, and that's potato leafhoppers. Exactly. Right now, this time of year is when the potato leafhoppers migrate into the state, usually, at least from years past. Now, it can be two weeks prior or two weeks later, but normally it's just right at or just before the second cutting of the alfalfa. And that's what they're doing right now, at least around the central part of the state, north central Kansas. The adult potato leafhopper migrates in, was blown in on southern breezes, if you will, because they overwinter in the along the southeast part of the United States, along the coast or further south. They come in every year about this time. And when they come in, they immediately start mating and or ovipositing eggs in the stems of the uh, alfalfa plants. A lot of times they're very small. They are very cryptically colored, which means they are colored a lot like the alfalfa. So a lot of times folks don't recognize that they're here yet, especially the adults, but they're busy, like I said, depositing eggs in the stems of the alfalfa plants. The nice thing about it is right now throughout the north central part of the state, at least for the last four or five days, Um, they're very busy cutting alfalfa or swathing alfalfa, and they will be for the next probably week. 
Now, as the potato leafhopper adults deposit eggs in the stems, those eggs then will be removed with the cutting of the alfalfa or the swathing. And that's one of the ways that we recommend getting rid of potato leafhopper populations. That way you get rid of them before the eggs hatch. Once the eggs hatch, the little nymphs, they're really tiny. They're really small. They're little green, uh, lime green insects that have a very herky-jerky type motion. When you're going out and you get one on your shoe or your leg, a lot of times folks get them confused with, with aphids. Aphids are slow moving. And they just crawl along the nymphs of the potato leafhoppers, herky-jerky kind of a motion. Those are the ones that actually do most of the damage, do most of the feeding. The adults will feed a little bit, but primarily it's the nymphs. The nymphs will feed 24-7. And as those eggs hatch, more nymphs hatch out. So as the alfalfa is swathed, removed from the field, the growers are removing pretty good chunks of the populations. But the adults are still here. The adults are going to continue to migrate into the state for another month. So what you need to do is get out and start monitoring your alfalfa at least a week after you cut it, after you start seeing regrowth, because, like I said, the adults are going to continue laying eggs. Those eggs are going to continue to hatch. The nymphs are going to continue to feed. They are sucking insects. So the adults and primarily the nymphs, they will pierce the leaves or the stems of the plant, and they will suck the juice out of the plant. Now, I don't know about you, Samantha, but I looked at the uh, forecast for the next two weeks. looks to me like it's going to be hot and dry. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the alfalfa is going to be, if it's not stressed already, it's going to be fighting heat and drought stress. And as these insects become more plentiful, they're going to be competing with those plants for that moisture because they're going to be sucking the juice out of the plant. But the potato leafhopper also, as they do that, they're introducing a toxin to the plant. And so they primarily feed around the tips of the leaves, and that will cause the leaf to turn a yellow. And we typically call that hopper burn. It starts from the end of the leaf, and if the feeding continues, it'll move down the leaf, it'll move down the stem. And if you couple that toxin with the removal of the of the plant's juice and you couple that with the stress of the heat and the uh, lack of moisture, that can really slow down the plant's ability to regrowth and therefore it can delay the third or the fourth cutting or third, fourth, and fifth cutting uh, if it goes on long enough. But potato leafhoppers, they're, they're coming into the state. There's a lot of them right now and there's not going to be a lot more in the next two or three weeks. The thing about potato leafhoppers if you do decide you want to treat for them, if you do decide you want to spray an insecticide, they're really easy to treat. They're really easy to kill. They're really easy to control. We don't even, oh, probably 15 years ago, we put out a lot of different trials to look at different insecticides. All the ones that we used controlled the potato leafhopper at the lowest rate possible. So if you do decide you want to put out a stubble treatment, if the potato leafhoppers seem like they're holding back the uh, regrowth to your alfalfa, you can go to the our management guides. We, we put out management guides every year. We updated them. You can go to the management guides for 2022 for alfalfa, and you can look up the uh, insecticides that are actually registered uh, for use against potato leafhoppers, and any of those will work at the lowest rate. So, that, keep that in mind. Generally, we don't recommend treating for potato leafhoppers. Generally, if you can, just swath or cut your cut your alfalfa and remove them, and that will take care of it. Uh, but they're going to be here for about the next two months at least, uh, feeding the alfalfa. So just keep that in mind when you're out looking at your alfalfa. They are just now getting started. Good to know, good to know, and excellent resources for producers if they're they're concerned with those insects, you know, infiltrating their alfalfa plants. So 
I know that we've also got another busy season approaching as the summer goes on here, and that's soybean planting. And you've been getting quite a few calls in regards to planting soybeans. Yes, soybeans are going into the ground as they can. And again, after wheat harvest, there'll be a lot of folks out planting uh, a second crop of soybeans. One of the questions I've been getting is, should they use an insecticide seed treatment? Now, Samantha, when I talk about seed treatments, I talk about insecticides. I'm not talking about fungicides. That's Plant Path and other folks. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about insecticides. They work really well. First of all, the insecticides, and we've tested them oh, probably for 20 years. Uh, when they first came out in the 90s, we tested them. The insecticides that they use for seed treatments, they work really well against the insects for which you know they are intended. However, in Kansas, we just don't, as a general rule, we just don't need insecticide seed treatments. We don't need them in corn, uh, sorghum, soybeans, any of our crops. Now, that being said, if you are planting soybeans into a high residue area where you know you've had problems in past years with grasshoppers or some other pest, you might want to consider an insecticide seed treatment on your soybeans. Other than that, they just, they, like I said, they work really well. We just do not need them in Kansas because we don't have, uh, generally we don't have problems with um, early season pests enough that it will justify the cost. And also, if you do decide to use an insecticide seed treatment, remember those insecticides are only good from the time of planting in the ground for 21 to 28 days, depending upon the rate of the seed treatment. So once you put that seed in the ground until it germinates, and then three weeks later or four weeks later, that insecticide will dissipate. Uh, we had some problems this year with corn where the growers were putting it in the ground early while it was dry, and then it didn't germinate, it didn't germinate, and then we were seeing some early season pests that we don't normally see, and they were thinking the um, pests were resistant to the insecticides, but it was just the seeds just didn't germinate for two or three weeks. And then when they did, there was only protection there for a week. The pests didn't come in. In this case, it was wireworms. Uh, they weren't active for like a month after the seed was, was planted, so there was no insecticide there to protect the seed. So keep that in mind. The insecticide seed treatments really work well for the pests that are on the label, but we just don't need them in Kansas unless you know a specific area that you're going to be planting into um, that you do have a pest that it might work for. Other than that, save the cost. Yeah, a way to save some money there, but also help prevent that resistance as well. Exactly. That, that will slow down resistance because that is a problem, and it is always going to be a problem. Uh, all the insecticides we've developed in the last 90 years, 100 years, uh, insects have become resistant to them. It's the same with corn, and we talk about BT corn um, for rootworms and for European corn borers. There's four commercially available BT events available. Corn rootworms have shown to be, uh, at least populations of corn rootworms have shown to be uh, resistant to all four commercially available events. So just use them if you need to, but use them judiciously. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. And again, welcome to Kansas. Thank you very much. That was Jeff Whitworth, our field crop entomologist extension specialist here at K-State. Things to know regarding alfalfa and potato leaf hoppers, as well as knowledge to keep in mind when we're thinking about insecticide seed treatments for our soybeans. Ahead of us still today, we'll have our weekly wildlife segment with Drew Ricketts, wildlife extension specialist here at K-State. We'll be back with that and more ahead on Agriculture Today from the K-State Radio Network. Today for this week's wildlife segment, we have with us Drew Ricketts, our Extension Wildlife Specialist. And today we're going to be covering a little bit unique of a topic, but it usually is when it comes to our wildlife segments. We're going to be talking about bats. Yeah, that's correct, Samantha. This time of year, our extension offices and and me directly get a fair number of contacts from homeowners who have bats in their attic or bats in their house, and that is a concern. 
Oftentimes, this time of year, you know, someone detects bats in their attic and they reach out to a pest control company and what they hear is, we cannot remove the bats right now because there are probably pups in the attic and we need to wait till fall to do that. The adults, of course, can fly all the time. The young pups have not learned how to fly yet at this time of the year. They're totally dependent on their mother for care. And oftentimes we end up with a little bit of a confusing message when we reach out to these pest control companies, and that's that the bats are protected and we can't remove them and harm them because they're protected. And that is, of course, a concern if we do have protected species that might be in the attic. But the bigger risk, really, and and the bigger reason that we typically don't try and remove bats at this time of year is we can't find all those flightless pups. And if we can't find the flightless pups, then there's no way for them to get out after the adults have been excluded, meaning that we put up a device that allows them to get out but not come back in. Since the pups can't fly, they're going to end up dying in the attic, and that ends up being a bigger health risk than the bats staying in the attic for another month or so. Either way there's health risks involved with having bats around. What are some of those? So in the attic, uh, the biggest risk comes from the feces, and there's a a fungal disease that we can get from a fungus that grows on the feces, and that's called histoplasmosis. And so that that would be a respiratory illness that we might develop from from that fungus being in the air. Uh, There are also bat bugs, which are kind of like bed bugs and some other ectoparasites that might be on the bats that could bite us. And those probably aren't going to transmit a disease, but they're, they're not fun to think about being in our houses. When we have a bat in the living space of the house, uh, that's the greatest concern. And the potential there is transmission of rabies. Because bats' mouths are so small, when we're asleep in a room, it's possible for a bat to land on us bite us and us not know it. We may not even have a a big enough wound to be able to tell that that bat bit us. So everyone in the house needs to be able to answer the question, did I come into contact with the bat? And if not everyone in the house can answer that question as a definitive no, then we need to try and collect that bat so that it can be tested for rabies. If it can't be tested for rabies, then the best next step to take would be to reach out to the health department. And and that's who you're going to reach out to to have the bat tested for rabies as well is your local health department. But we need to reach out to the health department and consult with them about whether or not we need to have treatment for post-exposure treatment for rabies, which is a series of shots. An expensive for some cases too. Yes, that's true. Sometimes health insurance is not going to cover this and it's a five shot series and it can be up to $10,000 for that series. You mentioned the removal process not being easy this time of year. What are some next steps for people listening to know about? Sure. So again, that typical removal process is just putting up a one-way exclusion valve. It's oftentimes a flap of screen or something like that over the entrance. Once the bats are out, then the entryway that they come in, which can be as small as like a quarter inch crack, we need to seal that back up. Black expanding foam works really well. If you do end up hiring a pest control company to take care of this problem for you, oftentimes they will take care of removing the bats through exclusion and then also putting in the permanent measures for exclusion as well. Some good resources for learning about bats in houses and how to deal with them would be your K-State Research and Extension Wildlife page, www.wildlife.k-state.edu. Wildlife and Parks, Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks has a really good resource if you Google Bats in Houses, KDWP, that will come up. Bat Conservation International also has some really good resources. If you are looking for somebody to help do the job for you, there is a list of nuisance wildlife control operators on the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks website as well, and they list what species they deal with and what areas they cover. Excellent. Well, we'll have some of those resources listed in the show notes. That can be found at agtoday.net. That was Drew Ricketts, our Wildlife Extension Specialist here at K-State. We'll be back with more tomorrow. I'm Samantha Bennett with Agriculture Today from the K-State Radio Network. Thank you.